The next speaker is Carolyn Fairless. She's a partner at Wheeler Tree O'Donnell in Denver, Colorado. Carolyn has practiced extensively in federal and state courts in Colorado, focusing on professional liability, product liability, intellectual property, and commercial litigation. Her topic today is ethical issues surrounding settlement negotiations, which is of great interest to in-house counsel. Welcome, Carolyn. Good afternoon. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking to you, 18 minutes, talking to you about settlement negotiations and the ethical considerations that you should be keeping in mind as you do that. Some of you may be asking, well, gosh, why should we even care about that? Because everybody knows that you blow smoke in the context of settlement negotiations. And as you'll see, there are a number of reasons why you will want to do that. I'm going to focus on three primary topics here today. First, I'm going to focus on who can you speak to? Second, what can you say? And finally, what terms can you negotiate as part of a settlement within the bounds of ethics? So I mentioned, why should you care about what's ethical in the context of settlement discussions? For those of you who are actually dealing with opposing counsel or opposing parties, there are some scary statistics out there. So we've seen a lot for you Tom Cruise fans, some for you Giorgio Armani fans, and now for you statistic fans, here's the latest statistics I've seen from the ABA. In 2010, the ABA did a survey of various states disciplinary regulatory boards, and what they found was of 1.3 million active lawyers, about 818,000 disciplinary complaints came in that year. For those of you who aren't math geeks, that means that the average lawyer is going to get grieved about once every 11 years. Now, I do believe that some lawyers have more than their fair share of grievances, and we all know who they are, but given how many cases are settled, given how often we talk about settlement negotiations, you don't want to be in that category being one of the uh, one of the every 11 years getting grieved in connection with the settlement. Also, lawyers are sued from time to time based on things that they do during the course of settlement negotiations. And even for those of you who are with a client who are not yourself negotiating with the other side, you want to make sure that your settlement sticks. You don't want the plaintiff to be able to come back and say that because there was something inappropriate that was said during settlement negotiations, or because there was an inappropriate term included in the settlement agreement itself, that that agreement is not enforceable against them. As I mentioned, the first thing that we're going to be discussing is who can you speak to in the course of settlement discussions. In connection with that, there are a couple of things that I wanted to take a look at. First of all, who must you speak to? Under Rule 1.2, it is the client's decision as to whether to settle and on what terms. Even if you're not happy with what the client decides to do in the course of settlement, it is the client's decision. So you can counsel the client that it is not a favorable settlement, but if the client decides that they want to settle, you as the attorney must accept that. In connection with that, there's varying opinions as to whether you can even initiate settlement discussions without the consent of your client. According to the restatement of lawyering, a lawyer can initiate but not conclude settlement discussions without specifically discussing that with the client. The ABA has set forth some guidelines that it issued in 2002 on settlement discussions, and they take a very different position than the restatement. What the ABA has said is that the very fact that you're bringing up settlement can affect the client's case. And so therefore, before even talking about settlement with the other side, you should make sure that your client has approved that course of action. And what the ABA goes on to say is that if the other side broaches settlement with you and you have not discussed that with your client, the best course is to say that, to simply be noncommittal and say, I need to talk with my client before I can get back to you. So. Be careful if you're going to have settlement discussions and you haven't talked with your client about that. Also, you have a duty, of course, to keep your client reasonably informed about a matter under Rule 1.4, and in connection with that, you need to let them know what's going on once you start those settlement discussions. Now, if you have pre-approval, that's something that's permitted under the rules. 
So let's say, for example, your client tells you, I'm going to give you a million dollars in authority to settle the case, and you have a deal with the other side for $800,000, clearly within your authority. That's permitted under the rules. If there's a question as to whether it's within your authority, or if you just want to be careful, you will contact your client and get their specific consent before you actually firm up the terms of the settlement and tell the other side that you have a deal. Um, again, this is because it is the client's call. You cannot request irre irrevocable authorization from your client. So even if your client gives you authority, it is always the client's prerogative to retract that authority and tell you that they want to do something different. You also are not ethically permitted to require that the client obtain your approval in order to settle. Again, it is the client's decision. Um, and this should almost go without saying, but you also should never settle a case using your own money without telling the client about it. Um, somewhat amazingly, there have been reported decisions where plaintiff's lawyers have had a case dismissed because they filed the case after the statute of limitations had expired. Rather than telling their client that the case had been dismissed, they quote unquote settled the case, gave the client a pot of money out of their own funds, and told the client that they had resolved the matter. Um, and the, as you can imagine, the ethical um, opinions are, are not looking very favorably on that behavior. So next subject is who may you speak to? Under Rule 4.2, you may not speak with someone who you know to be represented by counsel unless their, their counsel has given you that authorization. Now, some lawyers in the past have said, well, gosh, if the rule doesn't let me speak with the other side who is represented directly, maybe I can do it indirectly. And that's not okay either. There's an ethics opinion by the ABA that was issued in 1995, which says you cannot do through an intermediary what you are prohibited from doing directly. So you can't hire a private investigator to go speak to the other side. That is still a violation of your ethical prohibition in Rule 4.2. The ABA went on in another ethics opinion to say, even if you think that the other lawyer has not communicated an offer of settlement to his or her client, you may not ask that client whether the offer has been communicated, which left some lawyers in a conundrum. On the one hand, you want to settle the case and you want to fulfill your duty to your client to get the best result by doing so, but yet on the other hand, you know in your heart of hearts that the other lawyer is not speaking with the client. How do you get past that? In 2011, just last year, the ABA issued another opinion that shed quite a bit of light on that subject. And what that opinion said is that it is permissible, and it's not an indirect violation of Rule 4.2, for you to counsel your own client to speak with the other side. And what that opinion went through was a number of the bases for why that made sense. First of all, it is certainly permissible in any case where parties are represented for the parties to have direct communication. Also, in your, as, your, as part of your duty to competently represent your client, you need to be able to tell your client what their rights are and the fact that they have the right to speak directly to the other side. So the ABA said, because you're simply telling your client what their legal rights are, it's permissible for you to advise your client of that. Before this opinion came out, there had been some state ethics opinions that had looked at the issue and that had reached conflicting decisions on whether the client had to affirmatively ask you if that was permissible. And the ABA said the client does not have to initiate the request. You can broach the subject with your client because otherwise sophisticated clients who know that they can have direct communication would be at an advantage over unsophisticated clients. So that, that has really helped the landscape if you think that the other side is not having those kinds of conversations with their own client. Now, what can you do in the context of these discussions with your client? 
the assistance that you give them in talking to the other side can be substantial assistance under this opinion. You can help them craft letters. You can help them with putting together their message to the other side. What you cannot do, however, is what the ABA opinion referred to as overreaching. And the ABA gave some examples. For example, if you are going to ask the other side to enter into an enforceable agreement, if you are going to ask for an admission against interest, or if you are going to ask the other side to reveal confidential information, you need to be very careful in doing any of those to make sure that the other side knows that they are advised to speak with their attorney before doing any of those three things. So if you're counseling your, your client or if you're in-house, you want to be able to tell people, look, here's what we want to do. Here's the deal we want to reach. I advise you to speak with your lawyer before you agree or disagree with that. If you are going to draft a settlement agreement for your client to hand to the other side directly, you want to include what the ABA referred to as conspicuous language on the signature page, making very clear that they should speak with their counsel before entering to the agreement. But it is permissible for you to circumvent the lawyer under those circumstances. Now that we've figured out who we can speak with in the context of settlement discussions, the next question is, what can you say in those settlement discussions? Now, some commentators have opined that we should always take the high road and we should always be completely candid in our dealings with third parties. And in fact, Rule 4.1 suggests that. If that were the actual case, everyone needs to get out their checkbook because you're going to pay a lot more in settlement than you otherwise would have because you would be revealing to the other side everything about your settlement intentions. Other people say, well, gosh, you should be able to engage in a certain amount of deception in the context of settlement discussions. And everybody knows that what you say in the context of negotiation is not necessarily the truth. In reality, there's a middle line. Under Rule 4.1, you cannot knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third party. What does that mean in the context of negotiation? Unfortunately, there's no definition that's given by Rule 4.1. There's guidance that is given by the rule, guidance that's given by the ethics opinions, but there's no clear definition. So what do they say are some of the guidelines for you? First of all, the comment to the rule says that estimates of price or value or intentions regarding settlement are not material facts. So if you tell somebody, I don't think that your damage claim is X, I think that your damage claim is Y in the context of negotiating a settlement, that's perfectly per permissible. <clears throat> the ABA went on to issue an opinion in 06 that talked a little bit more fulsomely about what it means to have a material misstatement of factor law under Rule 4.1. And what they say is puffery is okay. They also refer to it as puffing, posturing, all the P's. And as long as you're doing a P word, then you're all right in uh, making whatever statements you're doing in settlement. So what is a P word? First of all, you can exaggerate or you can underestimate the strengths or weaknesses of your case. You can tell the other side, you know what, we feel really strongly about this legal defense and this is why we think we're going to win on summary judgment even if your evaluation to the client revealed otherwise. You can also tell them about your willingness to make concessions and understate that. And again, that is not a material fact because what the opinion says is the other side knows that it's not reasonable to rely upon that. There's a case that was filed against Texaco where the plaintiff's lawyer contended that Texaco's attorneys had made a material misstatement of fact in connection with the settlement. And in that case, the Texaco attorneys told the plaintiff's lawyer, we're going to pay, we will only pay $143,000 to settle the case. The plaintiff's lawyer later found out that Texaco had in fact paid $650,000 to settle similar cases. And they claimed that there had been a misrepresentation. And the court in that case said, no, that's puffery, that's posturing, that is not a misrepresentation of material factor law. 
Um, there are cases, however, where lawyers have been sanctioned or found by courts to have done such a thing. So if, for example, the defendant's lawyer in the Texaco case had said, we have never settled a case for, for $650,000 when, in fact, the true facts were otherwise, that would have been a violation of 4.1. There have been lawyers who have been grieved where they have misrepresented the extent of insurance coverage. They've told the plaintiff's attorneys, for example, we have $100,000 in insurance coverage, when in fact they knew that there was a million-dollar policy. And those are the kinds of things that will give rise to potential liability under Rule 4.1 and potentially undo your settlement as well. Other examples that are given by the ABA as to what is a material misstatement are if you misstate, for example, in a labor dispute, the benefit cost that you're going to be providing to the plaintiffs. And the specific example given was that the plaintiffs in a labor dispute say they want a particular benefit, and you tell them, well, we can't do that, or we will do that, but the cost to the company is $100 per employee when you know the cost is $20 per employee. That's a violation of the rule. The ABA also gave us examples misrepresenting the existence of documentary evidence or the admissibility of documentary evidence. So if you tell the other side that you have a document, but you don't, or if you tell them that that document is going to crucify them at trial when you know that the document is not admissible, that is a material misstatement. Now, as a practical matter, I can't imagine any plaintiff's attorney worth his or her salt saying, just give me the document if you tell them a document exists. But lawyers may say, this witness is going to testify as to X, Y, Z, um, when in fact that's not true. Again, those are the types of things that you cannot say in the course of settlement negotiations. Now, do you have an affirmative duty to tell them the things that they may not know? The quite short answer is that you do not. And I learned about this in an interesting case where I had a client sued for malpractice. And at first I thought the case was extraordinarily defensible because the allegation against my client was that my client, who was a defense lawyer, had been retained by an insurance company, had settled a case, and should have known that the insurance company that purported to hire him was in fact a Ponzi scheme. And so when the time came for the settlement to be paid, the house of cards had fallen apart, the gentleman who operated the Ponzi scheme was going to prison, and there was no money to pay the settlement. I'm thinking, this is a great case. How could he have known that this was a Ponzi scheme? Well, come to find out, the lawyer involved was himself defrauding what he thought was the insurance company through fraudulent billing, what, what we call bad facts in the context of litigation. So the first thing I did was to research, can I settle this case without telling the plaintiff's attorney what I have just found out? Short answer is yes. As a general matter, with very limited exceptions, you do not have any obligation to tell the other side bad facts about your case. So you may know, for example, and this is the specific ex example given in the ethics opinion by the ABA, you may know that your client's case is barred by the statute of limitations. You may know that it's completely dead in the water on timeliness grounds. And what the ABA says is you don't have to tell that to the other side, and in fact, you can continue to negotiate a settlement. And the distinction the ABA drew was that statute of limitations are typically an affirmative defense, meaning that the defendant bears the burden of proof and may choose, for reasons that are still a little bit unknown to me, to not pursue the defense. And if the defendant does not put the defense out there and ask for dismissal, the case will continue on, and presumably at some point, if the merits are there, judgment will enter. The ABA distinguished from cases where there's a jurisdictional requirement and said, okay, you know, we're not, we're not gonna do that. So what if the judge asks, if the judge asks you if you are going to uh, if you have settlement authority, if you have a bottom line, the rule is no different, which is that you don't have a duty to disclose those things to the other side. And if a judge asks, the proper answer to, is to simply decline 
to answer the question and tell the judge, I'm sorry, but I cannot give you that information without violating my duty of confidentiality to my client. So quickly, what terms can you request in a settlement? Can you prohibit the opposing lawyer from representing other clients? Uh, the short answer is no. That's an unreasonable restriction on his or her right to practice. Can you accomplish the same result by saying, well, I'll just retain the other lawyer after the case is over? Again, the short answer is no. You cannot do indirectly, again, what the ethical rules prevent you from doing directly. Can you prohibit the other attorney from revealing information learned in connection with the case or using that information? You can prevent the revealing of information because, again, the lawyer simply keeping client confidence is confidential, but you cannot prohibit the other side from using information that's learned in his or her representation of future clients because that is an unreasonable restriction on their right to practice. You cannot require them to identify other clients. You can ask them to return documents. You can ask for an affidavit if you're only asking for truthful testimony not for testimony that may be acceptable to you. Uh, most places say you can ask them to forego a fee, but you cannot ask them to provide indemnity. So to conclude, short answer is to make sure that everything is done ethically within reason, of course. Thank you for your time.